it is my huge pleasure today to well or this morning for them to uh welcome um sharon and jill from the bank of canada who will be talking to us about communicating under uncertainty and you know i'm always struck by the famous greenspan quote which is uh I'm going to probably not get it exactly right here, but it, uncertainty is not just a feature of monetary policy, but it is the defining feature of the monetary policy landscape. And so uh, as this uh, RPN has been focused on and thinking about a lot, you know, communication is increasingly a part of monetary policy. And if uncertainty is always a, a feature of the landscape, it's very clear that we, we live in a world where communication of uncertainty is a big thing. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll add one other thing, which which I always found very interesting, which is um, in in a paper with um, with Anna Cislak and and uh, Stephen Hansen and Song Xiao, uh, we we were looking at the FOMC transcripts and looking at the way in which uncertainty evolves over time. And what was super interesting was that, you know, the crisis, the global financial crisis was not the time that the FOMC in their own deliberations was most uncertain. Um, it was actually just before it. It was this build up before. And then once you were in the kind of uh, the heat of the, the crisis, there was quite a lot of certainty. Now, the certainty was, of course, about a, a suffering economy, a downside uh, that had realized, but it, that wasn't the uncertainty. I guess right now is an exciting time and an uncertain time for policy. So I'm sure plenty of the people joining in uh, are really excited to hear um, what you have to say. Uh, I'm going to hand over now. Uh, actually, I, I should have asked who is uh, one of you will speak first and, and, and give you the floor. Uh, and, and then you can. So Sharon's going to go first. And then as you speak, um, what I will do is um, I will filter any questions. So if you're in the audience and you ask questions through the um, the Q&A function, I will filter them at appropriate times. If either of you, when you're speaking, would like, think now is a good time for a break for questions, then, then, then let me know and I will filter any that I have. Otherwise, uh, once you're done, we will uh, start a more general discussion um, at, at that point. But otherwise, let me hand the floor to you and just tell you, th th say again, thank you very much for joining us and for, for, for giving us this exciting talk. Thanks, Michael. Well, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. It's really a pleasure for us to be with, here with you today. Um, we're really um, pleased to have the opportunity to talk about a paper we've recently written on communicating uncertainty in a crisis. And this is a paper that's going to be published in a volume that Michael's actually putting together. Now, the paper itself is not a technical academic paper. It's really more a purposeful description of an episode of Knightian uncertainty. Um, so, you know, maybe you want to interpret it a little bit as economic history, but in real time and from the point of view of insiders. So um, a few definitions, I'm sure most of you are aware of this, but, you know, nighty uncertainty itself um, is what we use when we're referring to unknowable aspects of the future. And it differs from risks, which are potential outcomes where we can assign probabilities to, to, to the risks. So the paper itself is going to review strategies that the Bank of Canada followed in treating and communicating during an unknowable episode. Um, and it can be seen as a case study of 19 uncertainty as faced by monetary policymakers in a central bank. In particular, it highlights how 19 uncertainty is treated and communicated differently than risks. So when we first wrote this paper, which was uh, probably about a year and a half ago, we called the paper uh, the, the, the title was Life During Sort of Wartime, um, and then uh, on to Communicating Uncertainty. Um, this was a little bit of my little homage to the Talking Heads, which is one of my favorite bands. But also, we were using the analogy of wartime to frame this most pervasive economic uncertainty to hit us in decades, which was, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, since then, of course, with a real war transpiring with, uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the analogy felt uh, inappropriate and, and insensitive, so we dropped it. But the principles of how we're explaining uncertainty in the context of economic forecasts and monetary policy conduct uh, still, uh, it, it, during an unprecedented crisis like this, I think still apply. So that's the framework we're going to use to talk about what happened when the pandemic hit, how the Bank of Canada acted, and how it communicated during this time of great uncertainty. So, so Sharon's gonna set it up and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about our response. 
So let me start by just talking a little bit about the importance of central bank communications. So clear communications do make for more effective monetary policy and a better functioning economy, and that's true in good times and in bad times. Now, what does clarity mean? So clarity means a lot of different things. It means what the monetary policy mandate is. And in the Bank of Canada's case, that this means what's the objective, which is low and stable inflation, and what's the inflation target, and that's the midpoint of a 1% to 3% range. Their clarity also refers to the ways in which the central bank will respond to developments in the economy and financial system, or what's the reaction function. And clarity also means providing information around the risks and uncertainties that are facing the outlook and how policy decisions take all of this into account. So let's think a little bit about normal times. So in normal times, transparency and communication can be, you know, there can be a number of different ways. Around the monetary policy decision at the bank, we have regular publication of the forecasts of the Canadian economy. Um, that also includes discussion of risks. We have a press release that goes through the explanation of the policy decision. And we also, through the opening statement at the governor's press conference, um, he touches on a review of key topics that were inside the policy discussion. Um, I mention that because this is really different than other central banks. It's almost a little bit like minutes, but it's not minutes. But it captures some of what other central banks might publish in their minutes. So, again, transparency is really also going through frequent communications. And it will include other things, other speeches, interviews with the media, other forms of outreach and meetings with external groups, so a lot of different forms of communication. Now, in normal times, you know, we regard it as quite normal for there to be misalignment of market views and interest rates um, on, in terms of what the central bank thinks versus what markets think. So at the Bank of Canada, we really strive to explain our policy decisions and reduce uncertainty, but not force alignment. Um, and in other words, we're really striving to help markets and others understand our reaction functions. This is what I mentioned earlier. And so, again, how do we respond to economic and other economically, sorry, economic developments and other economically important developments? And as part of that, we do not, as part of our normal, tra um, our normal um, transparency, publish an explicit numerical policy path. So now central bank communicators are really well versed in explaining risk and uncertainty, at least since the great moderation. You know, we can talk about risks and things we can assign probabilities to. We talk about uncertainty or nighty uncertainty. And again, that's what we don't or can't know with any assurance or credibility. And we communicate about how we incorporate risk and explain uncertainty in our monetary policy frameworks. So um, finally, I think it is important to mention that there is a pretty key trend in communications and central banks lately. R the communications have been moving to less technical, more accessible, and more relatable content. And so in this context, the, pandem the COVID-19 pandemic both provided a case study on 19 uncertainty, but also an accelerant of that trend that I was just talking about in more accessible communications. So, let me go on a little bit to risk management and monetary policy. Um, and, you know, I'm going to start, I'll, honestly, I'll start with a little bit of self-promotion here. Um, Jill and I did write a discussion paper back in 2017 on communicating uncertainty in monetary policy. Um, so that was broader, actually, than the 19 uncertainty. We talked about risks. We talked about uncertainty. We went through what the bank's process is in coming to a monetary policy decision and the various communication channels along the way and how uncertainty was brought into the discussion of the decision. One of the things we noted in that paper is that 19 uncertainty is really treated differently from sources of risk because it cannot be quantified. Um, and when a source of 19 uncertainty arises, what the bank has to do is figure out how to deal with it. And that could mean inside the base case forecast um, and important to explain how or whether that source of uncertainty has actually been taken into account. Um, the bank can also attempt to quantify maybe part of the uncertainty, maybe by assuming the status quo or a discounted worst case scenario, or maybe make some sort of assumptions on its effects. Um, and usually uh, the way this would show up is economic projections that are subject to 19 uncertainty 
are conditioned on a very specific assumption. And so, again, that idea of going through assumptions and scenarios, whether it's including or excluding in one particular way, that has been the traditional approach of the Bank of Canada. And that was leading up to the crisis. And there are examples of that that even preceded the global financial crisis. So um, another thing I'll mention here is, again, on that same topic, that our former governor, Polaz, gave a lecture in 2020, the Hansen Lecture, as it was known, where he talked about risk management. And I think this is another really important point, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail here on it. And when we were thinking about risk management and policy, a lot of the times we realize that there are really a whole bunch of different policy rate paths that could lead to very similar outcomes in GDP and inflation space. And so then risk management often would take the form of choosing among those paths so that you would have some better outcome outside of that mandate decision. Because if a whole bunch of different paths are all delivering you very similar outcomes on the mandate, then you know there are other things we care about might not be the number one priority, but if we're gonna do better on those other things, that's a better way to go. So I thought that was a really important lesson learned from that lecture. So now let's think about the pandemic. So the COVID-19 pandemic required massive and sudden shifts in policy. Calculating odds, developing forecasts, and even knowing risks was nearly impossible. So there was a really interesting um, statement made by Mike Ryan, who is, head of emergency health, um, sorry, head of health emergencies program at the World Health Organization. So he was quoted as saying, you can't think in predictions, you can only think in scenarios. There are so many ways that variables affect the outcome in extreme ways. So keep that in mind as we go forward in this talk today. So now again, risk management and monetary policy, we need to acknowledge and accept uncertainties. We need to consider all sorts of possibilities we need to identify risks and sources of 19 uncertainty. We need to think about the consequences of making a policy error. In the COVID-19 case, we could not know the timeline for vaccines, treatments, or cures. But it was clear that the pandemic would have devastating impacts on economies. We were experiencing the rapid shutdown of large chunks of the Canadian economy, and we know that this was replicated in many, many other countries. So what did we do? Well, we followed the guidance of Mike Ryan, though, to be honest, we read the citation to Mike Ryan after we put together the, the, this, this way of approaching things. But basically, policymakers could develop a framework for thinking about the economic impacts of COVID. We could do this by thinking of different scenarios with different assumptions around what might happen in public health space, including just COVID types of outcomes and policies to try and mitigate those outcomes around containment measures that governments may have been putting in place, and also around fiscal supports that the government was, um, governments were introducing. So um, that was the starting point. And now let me pass it across to Jill. So as, as I think you pointed out pretty clearly there, Sharon, we were looking at uncertainty in the extreme in terms of a policy response. Um, and I think now it's clear why you, you'll understand why that wartime analogy made sense when we originally wrote the paper, because during the, the start of the COVID pandemic and throughout the crisis, we've seen a, a rapid mobilization of the machinery of government. We've seen massive domestic spending deployed. We've seen huge shifts in economic activity as parts of the economy were closed and others were ramped up to provide the necessary PPE and other other types of uh, product, vaccines, all of that. And we've seen this rallying of the public for the greater good, this sense of everyone pulling together, um, all of very analogous to, to what you see during a wartime. Now for central banks, uh, this of course meant that we had unprecedented coordination with fiscal authorities, which was new for us, uh, and a very quick pivot to a, a very different policy stance for many and adjustments to the ways that we were engaging with, with markets and with the public. Now, this was mirroring a change in public communications that was taking place in all public institutions, uh, whether it was monetary authorities or governments of all levels, certainly public health agencies. Uh, the situation was calling for much more frequent communication, plainer language, reassuring content, outreach to groups that weren't being reached. 
And for us, of course, it was imperative that we were clear to markets and, and reassuring to the public. Now, in one of the very first of these CEPR central bank communication seminars, Professor Alan Blinder said that, that, and I agree with him, of course, that reaching the public is the next frontier of central bank communications. But I think he expressed quite legitimate doubt about central banks' ability to get people to pay attention and understand. Um, getting people's attention certainly wasn't the issue at the beginning of the pandemic. People wanted to hear from us. They wanted to hear more. They wanted to understand what was happening. Um, in, in March of 2020, which is when the first wave of the pandemic hit here in Canada, uh, the Bank of Canada lowered our policy rate uh, in several steps, but very quickly down to the effective lower bound uh, from 175, which is where it had been at the start. Uh, we put in place a number of uh, market facilities and programs to support the economy and markets and to keep credit flowing, um, very similar to what other central banks were doing. And we engaged uh, quite rapidly in quantitative easing. Uh, all in all, our, our combined facilities and programs ramped up our balance sheet from about 125 billion at the beginning to about 500 billion in very short order. And as we were taking all of these uh, extraordinary steps, we were increasing the transparency around our actions and boosting our efforts to explain them as clearly as we could for Canadians. And, and that meant you know, much more frequent speeches and media activities uh, much more content on our website, which was being developed very quickly, explainers on the market operations and the like, uh, and, and a heavier social media presence, uh, mostly on Twitter, which is the channel that we, we use predominantly for this type of messaging. And of course, we were moving back into forward guidance. Now, forward guidance was first used by the Bank of Canada as a policy tool during the global financial crisis and the recession. And we deployed a conditional commitment at that point to keep interest rates at the effective lower bound until the end of the second quarter of 2010 in order to achieve the inflation target. So it was time-based commitment. Uh, we actually ended it a little bit early. We ended it in the, in the spring of 2010. Um, now, since you know, throughout, during and, and since the crisis for many central banks, forward guidance has become an important policy tool, uh, frequently pulled out of that monetary policy toolkit and of course, in its, in its extreme use, uh, the central banker basically takes all the sources of uncertainty on board, collapses them down to zero, and informs the market of its plan for policy rates, the kind of, con the kind of commitment that we were using during the crisis. And you know, under the right circumstances, this certainly enhances the power of the single policy instrument to achieve the goal, particularly when rates, of course, are at the ELB. But during normal times, the Bank of Canada has avoided using forward guidance. Um, that was a decision by our governing council in, in the words of our former governor, Stephen Polas. He saw forward guidance as coming with the risk of markets putting weight on only one policy path and thereby reducing the emphasis on their own analysis. So, you know, everyone taking that, that one way bet. Um, for him, it and, and for our members of governing council, that it, it meant that the market signals become less informative, uh, and it takes that two-way trade, uh, that normal two-way trade, out of the market. But of course, uh, COVID were not normal times, and so we did begin to use forward guidance again. First, on our quantitative easing uh, in June 2020, when we said that the bank uh, maintains a commitment to continue large-scale asset purchases until the economic recovery is well underway. So not very specific, uh, but it, uh, some guidance. And then we started to use forward guns on our policy path in July of 2020, when we said the governing council will hold the policy rate at the effective lower bound until economic slack is absorbed so that the 2% inflation target is sustainably achieved. And then we started providing an estimate of when we thought that that absorption of slack would occur in our projection. Um, so we started an est providing an estimate of when the slack would be absorbed, acknowledging, of course, that that was a moving target. So we were using state-based forward guidance, but with an estimate of when we thought the state would be achieved. And that turned out to be a bit of a challenge because markets were taking that estimate as time-based forward guidance rather than state-based. Uh, COVID-19 also changed how, how our forecasts were presented, which uh, was consistent with other central banks. Uh, certainly the Bank of Spain uh, followed exactly the same approach. So our typical practice would be a base case forecast with a discussion of risks around the outlook. 
uh, that was dropped in favor of scenarios with a range of possible outcomes uh, and talking about how changes in the assumptions about the night and uncertainty may impact the economy. So we began that in April of 2020 in our monetary policy report that didn't contain a forecast at all, just contained illustrative scenarios. Uh, we said the outlook was too uncertain at that point to provide a complete forecast. However, our analysis of the alternative scenarios suggested a level of real activity down about 1% to 3% in that first quarter of 2020. That's, of course, remembering March is when the, when the first wave hit. And then a 15 to 30% drop in activity in the second quarter uh, compared to Q4 2019. So it was a very broad uh, range of possibilities. By July, we were comfortable enough to move back to a central scenario. It wasn't a projection, but a, but a, a, a closer uh, scenario. And then in October of 2020, so six months later, we reverted back to a, a very highly conditional uh, projection. So similar to what we had been doing pre-crisis. And since then, we've, we've consistently deployed that type of technique. Uh, the most recent time would have been uh, taking into account the nighty and uncertainty associated with the invasion of Ukraine. So in our recent monetary policy report, we had a special box on the invasion uh, where we discussed the channels through which the war would uh, influence the Canadian economy. Uh, but the uncertainties of, source, of course associated with the war made it impossible to provide precise estimates of those impacts. And so what we did was give indicators of the direction of the impact through each channel and on inflation. Now, going back to the pandemic, through all of our communications, uh, it's pretty clear our goal was to, to try and restore and maintain confidence. So for markets, as Sharon mentioned, it was shifting some of the uncertainty back onto the Bank of Canada through forward guidance and clear communication about our market operations. For the public, it was about providing reassurance that rates would stay low as long as they needed to, to support the economy, making clear the linkages between the monetary policy actions that we were taking and our objectives and the anticipated outcomes. Now, worldwide, we've seen central bank governors during this period taking on, you know, enhancing their role as trusted experts to explain what's happening, as is typical during crises and what it all means. So, you know, really assuming that role of, of translating these complex concepts into relatable language. As Sharon said, this isn't a new role, and it's certainly been a trajectory that we've seen in central bank communications, but the efforts were definitely accelerated during the pandemic. And so we saw very simple language being used by governors. For example, Governor Tiff Macklem uh, said in, in July of 2020, rates will stay low for a long time. You can't get much clearer than that. Um, certainly in the Fed, uh, Chair Powell has, been, has moved to even plainer language. That's again been a trend uh, in the Fed, but, uh, but he has accelerated it. If you look at the 13 speeches he gave during, during that period, um, you know, including at the Fed Listens events and others that were very clear, very plain spoken. And, and the Bank of England, of course, which has been uh, a paragon of, of, of straightforward messages and layering messaging to make sure it's reaching all audiences. Now, in the past six months, as things have started to normalize, uh, we've started to unwind our extraordinary policy measures. And again, that was a communication challenge that, uh, that had to be handled well and delicately. We stopped QE uh, last October and moved into reinvestment phase. Uh, we stopped our forward guidance in January of this year, stepping back from the conditional commitment before we started our tightening cycle. Um, we moved to being trying to be much more transparent about the direction of our, of our intentions. Um, then we raised 25 basis points in March, uh, another 50 basis points in April and started our quantitative tightening. And while we're no longer using forward guidance, we still continue to be, for the Bank of Canada, certainly unusually clear about our policy path. Um, we've said that we expect that we'll need to get rates back to, to neutral and provided a range for neutral. Um, the, the last utterance by our governor on April 25th said that he expects the next move will have to be 50 basis points. Um, that's very unusual precision for the Bank of Canada outside of a forward guidance episode. And we've worked very hard to foreshadow and explain to market participants our moves into reinvestment in QT in advance of actually taking those actions. 
So uh, we've kind of developed a bit of a pattern in both cases. Uh, we had the governor out speaking publicly about the plan before it 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 was uh, before it was enacted, explaining the me mechanics to markets, explaining the impact ahead of making the policy change. So again, just trying to front run, pull some of that uncertainty back out by be, being very clear about our intentions. Um, as Governor Macklin has said, during periods like this, we, we want the central bank not to be a, an additional source of uncertainty, but, but a, a source of certainty. Now, even with all of this communication and all of this effort, it hasn't been enough to counter the, the rising public concern and the loss of trust and confidence in public institutions that we've seen. And if I just look at the Bank of Canada poll results, uh, we do routine and, and accelerated during the crisis public opinion surveys. Uh, and in early 2020, we were seeing that, that trust in the bank to act in the best interests of Canadians was down uh, compared to pre-pandemic levels. Trust in the bank to contribute to the successful management of the economy and to maintain low and stable inflation were also below pre-pandemic levels by a few points. Now, all of those measures had interestingly gone up during the pandemic when uncertainty was at its peak, when we were communicating a lot, when there was this sort of general trend to increased reliance and trust in public institutions. We did see that that those numbers pop up, uh, but this is unwound somewhat as the pandemic dragged on. Now, I guess I can take some comfort in the fact that while our numbers are down, they're not they're not down by as much as other public institutions. And so I think all of this effort uh, has had at least some effect. I'm gonna turn it back to Sharon to wrap up. Yeah, so just allow me just to give a few concluding comments. So crises really shine spotlights on central banks. Um, it places, they place greater importance on explaining how monetary policy actions are related to the central bank mandate and how they will help contribute to improving the overall well-being of the country and the citizens of the country. Um, now, COVID-19 and related um, 19 uncertainty really forced central bankers and other policymakers to evaluate how to best communicate in periods of extreme uncertainty and also to then assess lessons learned. Now, one of the things that we learned is then when we don't feel we can reasonably provide estimates, we're better off not doing so. False precision does not improve confidence. Um, instead, it's better to help others understand our thinking. And again, as in, as in COVID, this can be done by providing scenarios or describing channels through which uncertain developments could impact the economy. This approach has for us been confidence enhancing even during periods of heightened uncertainty. And in the end, when central banks better explain their policy actions and their, the effects to the citizens, it increases credibility and effectiveness regardless of what's going on around us. Stop there. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much. That's uh, almost exactly a half hour. So we have plenty of time now to uh, ask some questions. Um, uh, th there are some, some questions which I will forward from um from people uh, in the audience but i'm gonna i'm gonna take chair's privilege and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask uh one question which and, and i couldn't i couldn't help but you know when you call when you when you talk about uh mike ryan uh obviously i get very proud as a as he's a fellow irishman um <laughs> but but actually more importantly so so and again this has I should give the usual disclaimer this has nothing to do with my role on ireland's fiscal council but in my in my sort of notebook I have for fiscal council things I actually have and I have it here in front of me I have a bunch of his tips on I'll read them out because I won't you won't be able to see it but I have a bunch of his tips on emergency management because I think again we we took a lot of uh, message from him and, and the ones that the three bullet points that I wrote down were react fast be coordinated and be coherent I think that applies to fiscal and monetary pretty well in COVID have no regrets I mean that that I think is a trickier one for 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 central bankers, but but we can come on to that. And then the last one, which I've directly quoted, so I think that others may have been paraphrased. But if you need to be right before you move, you will never win. Perfection is the enemy of the good, you know. And I think that's a, a, it, it's it's of course um, it's of course super uh, important at some level, but. You know, Jill, you mentioned the issue of engagement and Alan Blinder's sort of uh, slightly negative uh, view about 
our central banking community's ability to engage a wider public. And I sometimes wonder, even in normal times, if central banks have too much of a desire to be precise, to be almost perfect. In the, like, and, and I say that as you know, somebody who for, for years wrote in the, in the way you're taught to write as a central bank, you know, the conditionality, the precision. It turns a lot of people off and, and, and straighter. But even when we try and talk straight and talk in a bit more of a casual way, I think that the desire for precision and conditionality just doesn't align with a lot of people. So, so I'm going to put that as a question. I under, you moved at a time of, of crisis to being precisely imprecise, to be acknowledging that we don't know everything. Should that only be in crisis times or should central bankers be a little bit more loose and, and just say, look, we don't know, but it could be this, it could be that, we're leaning on this. I, I put it out there as a, as a question. It, it's uh, it, you've basically wrapped up every conversation that I've had with my central bank communication colleagues around the world over the past decade. Now, no, I think that is exactly the question. Um, and I think, you know, when I, when we think about uh, the pandemic as an accelerant uh, to some of these trends, I, I don't think we're going to, we're going to see these trends unwind. Uh, I think people have gotten used to um, understanding their central bankers and, their expectation is now that that you know we as public servants will be clear and transparent and relatable. Uh, you know when when we think about the frontiers that we've been through, uh, I've been I've been watching or working in central banks for 20 or 20 years now, and um, you know we've we've taken a lot of steps towards being clearer and comprehensible. Uh, and I think this move into relatability. You know, what is your central bank doing for you? What are our actions? What impact do they have on you as a citizen? What choices are we making that are going to influence the choices that you have to make down the road? Um, I, I, I think we have an imperative to be more relatable. I think we need to listen more effectively to groups. Uh, and that's why you see things like the Fed listens. Uh, you see the the polling that we did um, in advance of our mandate renewal. You see the, the ECB's efforts. Uh, you know, these are these are not things that will be put back in a box and uh, and will revert back to our old ways of communicating. The the things that I'm obsessing about these days uh, are, you know, what how do we engage spokespeople at central banks? Uh, it doesn't always have to be, you know, a governor pronouncing from a podium. Um, you know, you can you you can make an institution more relatable and more relevant. Uh, by showing more of the institution, showing the diversity of thought. Uh, I think the other thing is that we have to find new ways of, of reaching audiences through different channels. I mean, central banks have typically used social media to drive traffic to their websites. Um, I don't think people are going to central bank websites anymore to look for the information. I mean, market participants are, uh, but ordinary citizens want us to speak to them on the channels where they get their information, and so that's going to be a bit of a um, a, a bit of a change in, in in technique as well as strategy for communicators. So let me add a little bit as well. Um, this was an issue that former Governor Polaz was really um, he was really engaged on. He found that the tendency to you know is it 5.2 or 5.3 like the tendency of economists at times to put those tenths in um, was not necessarily good because, and everybody thought that the number had a lot more precision in it. And while it was just small steps, things that we did in our monetary policy report included actually going, a, going away and trying to be a little bit more vague, you know, maybe talking about, you know, growth on average of, you know, roughly 5% in, in the first half. Uh, I'm just pulling numbers out of the air here. Um, but numbers that would, you know, were rounder, uh, putting around, about, close to, things like that right into our monetary policy report. Because frankly, that's the way we were thinking. And again, small change, but we're trying to at least avoid some of the false precision that had been, we'd sort of, we'd fallen into as an institution. I think all central bankers had fallen into it. You give a forecast, you give a number. Um, and you don't usually see numbers of, well, we forecast one and then two, right? That's just not what central bankers do. But sometimes, frankly, that might be what people on the street want to hear, right? Like just, you know, is it growing or is it not growing? 
Yeah, it's 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 a double edged uh, sword, though, because when you when you move to less precision, um, you also uh, allow other people to interpret what you're trying to say. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. I, one of the examples I just used uh, when when Governor Macklem said in July of 2020, rates are going to be low for a long time. Uh, that's an exact quote. And now, of course, we're starting to increase interest rates and people are saying, but you said rates were going to be low for a long time. It's like, well, is two years a long time or is it, it, it in our heads, two years was a long time in 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 the in the view of some people out there. We are going back on our promise because uh, we're now increasing interest rates. And so, you know, what 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 you gain and I will still argue that the gain is is more than the loss. Um, it does open you up to a, a new kind of criticism. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so there's two people also on the panel um, who have worked on the area, and so I'll bring them in in a second. But uh, I'm going to race through some of the questions that have come in from the audience. So, um, Ben Norman asked the question. Um, Essentially, so so I think he 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 agrees with you and 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 this the, the 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 general mantra that you had. But the question was, how do you determine if your communication has been successful? So you started to touch on this a little bit when you mentioned the polls of the public, and I guess with the markets, you know. But but again, um, Sharon, you mentioned that alignment is not the objective. Uh, so some misalignment is fine, is normal. But, but so how do you how do you tell if the misalignment is okay misalignment or not great misalignment or, or, or other ways that you actually measure the success of this communication? Yeah, that's that's a really subtle question. I think um, in general, you know, it's not that we're not going to take an action out of fear of surprising markets, right? So I don't, and the reason I said it that way is because whether or not we surprise markets with an action is not an indication of whether or not we were successful in communications. We want to be taking the right actions for policy. But again, in general, if we're trying to be clear on the sorts of things we're looking at and the way we respond to shocks, then we wouldn't expect that actions are going to lead to large surprises in markets unless they're in response to really, really large shocks. And you know there was one such episode. Markets were quite surprised in January 2015 when we lowered our policy rates in Canada. Um, when this is right after commodity prices and oil prices, in particular, had fallen by I think I believe it was over 50% at the time, and in quite a rapid period of time. And we are a oil exporter, and markets were somewhat surprised at on the day the action was taken. But in retrospect, after that. Once we had, when we showed what the impact was on the projection and on the outlook for Canada, then we tended to get the buy-in not you know, quite quickly from analysts, um, external analysts who were like, yeah, you know what, we see it, this makes sense. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that's, you know, reinforcing that even if you get the market surprise, people understand the why that keeps you from being impeded in your decision. But in general, I, I think it's more volatility that you know, if some, something goes up on an announcement and then goes down with a speech a day later, this would be you know, maybe one, of, one of those things was probably not sufficiently clear. Um, so that's just one indication of a market. Yeah, and, we and, certainly, oh, go sorry, ahead. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna add one extra question which has just come in because I think it directly relates to this, this question, which is, you know, just just in terms of your experience, how did how did the transition from, you know, a sort of traditional forecast to this? We're not giving you a forecast, but we're going to give you a few scenarios. How did how did people react to that? What was the feedback you got on that? So, sorry, sorry, Jill, didn't mean to cut you off. No, it's it's quite all right. Um, Miss Sharon, you might want to jump in here. I mean, it certainly generated commentary, but uh, the commentary, I, I think the tone of the commentary was that people understood why, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, our, the economists that follow us, uh, the, the public commentary from, from, the, uh, from the experts that are, the expert bank observers, um, they were all, you know, no, they noted it, but they understood it. 
Um, going back to the original question, uh, you know, we look at inflation expectations. We, we certainly do frequent polling. Uh, we track, you know, we identify in advance the key messages uh, that we want to make sure are delivered in our communication products. And then we track how the extent to which those key messages get picked up in, in reporting and, and analysis. Um, you know, and then there's the kind of sort of softer techniques of, of tone and, you know, social media analysis and all of those types of things all imperfect, but if you use enough of them, you can get a sort of general sense. Yeah, so April 2020 was really interesting because again, middle of April or so is when we're coming out with our monetary policy report, which it was still very early in the pandemic. And I think, you know, on the one hand, people may have been surprised there was no projection when they first saw it. On the other hand, there was a lot of detail in terms of what the government had announced in terms of support measures for the economy, the various measures that we were undertaking, and then an explanation for the thinking behind it. So there was an appreciation for the detail of the analysis. But then the other thing was, this was not a period where there was a huge question in the policy response. Right. Like it was sort of, you know, so you're going to get a little more flack if if people are surprised by the policy and they don't see the projection. Right. That is a bad situation. That's a lack of communication. But here, everyone understood the need for aggressive responses very quickly. And so then the project, you know, not having a projection, but showing a 15 to 30 percent reduction in GDP by, versus two quarters earlier. Yeah, when you see those sorts of numbers and they line up with your expectation that a lot was and had been done, it, it does fit together even though there's no precision. So, so I think that, that situation um, worked partly because the policy response was rather obvious. I'm just going to check to see if, if uh, Claudiana or Ryan want to come in here, both, uh, both, both who work on, on, on these issues. So Claudiana, you go first. Thank you, thank you very much for for this presentation. I had I had a question referring to uh, actually to the advice that in in times of uncertainty maybe it's better for for central bankers to communicate in scenarios. So to communicate a reaction function in, in scenarios. Uh, does does this mean that as as central bankers we have more uncertainty on on the environment on the economy? But once once we we know in which scenario we are. We are certain about the the effect of our policy instruments. So, what is this? Uh, let's say the weights that uh, you want to put to uh, uncertainty about the environment and uncertainty about the, actually the effects of your policy instrument. So let me start just by saying. Um, the scenarios, some of the things we've had that were very effective were not actually so much scenarios with numbers going out. It would be more, um, well, what's the impact on the Canadian economy of a large you know, decline in commodity prices? Well, in order to understand that question, you have to know, was it a decline in demand that led to the decline in commodity prices or a decline in supply or an increase in supply? Because that matters to the Canadian economy. So when you start going through what could the driver have been and then give arrows up or down on various channels, at the end of it all, sometimes you end up with a clear direction and sometimes you don't. In the box that we just had in April 20, 2022 in our NPR on the war, the direction on the impact on inflation, every single channel was in the same direction, inflation higher. Because we're a commodity producer, the arrows were not in all the, all the same direction in looking at GDP. So we didn't have a clean bottom line because you sort of need more information on the various channels to, to to be able to flush that out more. And, and that's you know not a clear scenario, but I think it helped people understand what might be different about say the Canadian economy versus other economies that are facing you know, the same global shock, but not in a neighbor who is really, really close, right? Geographically close and with um, really tight um, trade ties. So, so, so that was helpful. Um, we haven't done as many quantitative scenarios, except, except the COVID was one specific example. And I think there, part of what we were trying to get away from was anticipating waves and their impacts. 
And that was one thing that we assumed away. We said, look, we know there will be waves and there are going to be ups and downs around what we're looking at here. And this would be, say, the July 2020 NPR. But we want to give you a sense of where we think, on average, the trajectory would be. So as a scenario, assuming away waves, but trying to get at the middle, if you will. And again, that seemed to be well accepted because everybody understood, yeah, you, you can't anticipate the waves. And we get that, you know, no wave, strong growth, wave hits, weak growth. But overall, upward trajectory. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Ryan? Did you? Oh, you're on mute. Ah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, so first I would just like to say thank you. This has been really enjoyable. Um, uh, I wanted to maybe ask if you could say a little bit more about your decision to leave uh, the midpoint out of uh, the inflation projections that you included in your, um, your April 2020 NPR. Uh, and, and in particular, I'm curious why you made that decision as opposed to just decreasing the precision of your forecast in a different way uh, for two reasons. Um, uh, one is because I would have thought that there would be some concern about um, uh, that decision in particular increasing disagreement in the cross section, but also transmitting uncertainty at an individual level. Um, and uh, having, having sort of done a review of how many central banks approached communication and their NPR surrounding the onset of the pandemic, I, I think maybe the Bank of Canada was the only, the only bank who chose to reduce the precision of their communication by specifically removing a focal point from their projections. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm trying to go off of memory in terms of, as you say, what the motivation behind it was. And I, hmm. you know, this may sound simplistic, but when you don't have um, in that April NPR, when you just have these wide scenarios, you know, it's sort of hard to map that into what it might mean in inflation space. And in terms of, you know, do you really want to take the midpoint and go to the midpoint? I think. It was just such a special circumstance that the objective in April 2020 was not to reinforce that within the typical projection horizon, we would get things back to two. I think there would, if, if and again, I'm, I'm going off of memory, I think, oh, and, I, and I, let me say this for the audience, I was not a member of governing council at the time, so please do not take my statements as representative of what any of the governing council views were at the time. Um, but I was involved in pulling together the NPR, and my sense was that in April 2020, it was still focused a little bit more on, wow, you know, this is, this is bad, and in real space, and let's try and think about what the way out is going to be, right? And so there was a little bit more trying to think through what does this mean in real space? And frankly, you know, then worrying a little further down the road about what that might mean inflation space. When I say further down the road, I mean in subsequent NPRs down, down the road. So I, that's, that's what I would suggest was more at the time that it would have been a little artificial to try and come down too precisely on a midpoint even at that point. Um, if you look, and I'm just going on about more details, if you look at how big and how uncertain the recovery was, you know, even thinking about mapping that into inflation space, you know, it, you, you have to have a pretty strong bounce back just from things reopening combined with a lot of fiscal policy to work through, are you going to be even closing our, um, you know, are you even going to be getting back to periods of no economic slack within a typical projection horizon, right? And so that's what I would say there that, again, it was just too uncertain and it would have been false precision. We are an inflation targeting central bank. And we did in July, if you remember, Jill mentioned this, in July, we did give the forward guidance on our policy path linked to economic slack with the ultimate objective of getting back to two, right? So we tried to keep our communications always in line with getting things back to two. 
in the policy space, but avoided, if you will, maybe what we would have seen as false precision in NPR space. So again, that is me trying to remember, and I, I'm hoping I'm not over talking it. Um, but um, yeah, it was just massive uncertainty. So, so Ryan, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to you and 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 let you uh, take a take a minute or so to to do some of your own shameless promotion, um, because you have you have done work on this more recently with Luba, right? So, so I think some of the people in the audience may be interested to hear what the, the experimental evidence of these different things is. And 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 just for for Jill and Sharon, you, you don't necessarily have to respond to this. You've said out quite clearly what Bank of Canada did, but this is sort of a, a chance for an academic to come back. So Brian, if you want to you're on mute again. Uh, OK, I, I think I've got it figured out now. Uh, so that's right. Um, Luba and I have uh, studied in a laboratory setting how it is that various approaches to uh, communication can influence the way that people form expectations. Um, so the the simple explanation of how it is that we do that is we, we sort of go into the lab. We have some data generating process that we sort of gamify. And, um, uh, and, and uh, in our experiments, this is just based on the simple uh, Newkinsian model, reduced form Newkinsian model. And we, we, what we do is we get uh, expectations from experimental participants. Uh, they're incentivized to form them as accurately as possible. We feed those into this model and then uh, these economies can evolve. And what, uh, what, we, what we wanted to learn in our experiments was what forms of projections um, are best at uh, stabilizing these economies and coordinating expectations, so on and so forth. And, uh, and one thing that we did that I thought was, was quite relevant here is we also came up with an incentivized way of um, measuring individual level uncertainty around point projections. So we, we didn't just uh, elicit the uh, central moment of people's expectations, but also higher order information about their expectations. And what we found was when you decrease the precision of um, central bank projections, so um, what we did is surrounded a point forecast by some amount of uncertainty, that, that uh, reduced the efficacy of point forecasts uh, specifically because it sort of undermined its ability to uh, serve as a focal point for projections. And uh, we, we, following the pandemic and following uh, that 2020 uh, April NPR, we, we actually also looked briefly at this policy of providing um, only higher order information uh, devoid of a focal point. And what we found is that that, that did uh, lead to pretty drastic increases in uh, both uh, the cross-sectional dispersion of, of point forecasts and also individual level un uncertainty. Uh, and if I if I remember correctly, it it may have been. I, I think what we found is that things were uh, there. There was more uncertainty measured either at the individual level or in the cross section. There was there was at least as much or more uncertainty with that particular form of communication than in our controlled treatments where we just provided no communication at all. So that's really interesting. Um, I think what I would say is, remember, we're not going to forever giving ranges without point forecasts. Um, we're trying, and, and when we're giving ranges, when, when we're giving a sense of uncertainty in our normal projections, it's, it's pretty, it's just try to avoid that false precision on a decimal point. In the end, I think what I would say is we did consistently talk about our policy, again, July 2020 NPR, our policy actions were being taken and the Ford guidance commitment was ultimately in support of achieving the 2% inflation target. So the commitment may have been based on, on um, economic slack, but that was so that we could sustainably achieve the target. So we did have that in our communications. The other thing is we did continue to conduct our surveys through this period, our business outlook survey and our Canadian survey of consumer expectations. And one of the things that was interesting, and maybe this is because as, as I just mentioned, it was a temporary phenomenon. We didn't see the longer run expectations on the consumer survey moving very much, if I'm remembering correctly. They, they, they stayed pretty well where they had been. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
So I, I think that, you know, if we combine those two things, you know, maybe a lesson learned is, you know, that temporary, temporarily stepping back from precision in a believable, you know, in a believable way, like a justifiable way, may be less likely to have the negative consequences that you're talking about. But in the end, you don't want to exclusively communicate that way because there are negative consequences. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, there's a there's a host of other questions which I'm going to try and get through. I'm going to I'm going to start. I'm going to relay this one from uh, Athanasius Orphanides, uh, who I feel, uh, yeah, th- this is this is a this is a regularly held discussion between policymakers and academics. Um, but but of course he was both. So um, I'd be interested to hear your views. The question is about how to communicate future policy. Um, he says, we've seen some central banks got in trouble with time-based forward guidance. Um, latest example, the Fed continuing to expand the balance sheet until March. The Bank of Canada has experience with the hybrid approach that connects with state-based guidance. Why not go all the way there, communicate a clear policy rule based on forecasts or contingent scenarios? What's the case against this simple and transparent approach? Sure. Um, first, I, I wish I could see you, Athanasio, so I can only see three people on the screen in front of us. Um, so, um, yeah, a really interesting question. And I would say that um, the difficulty, especially if we're dealing with a period of uncertainty, is trying to anticipate um, both shocks that may be relevant and which we may need to respond to, as well as impacts, effectiveness of policies, et cetera. That, you know, in the end, the world is a remarkably complicated place. And every time we think we've, you know, figured out, you know, uh, an effective way to go forward, we get hit with something that is a huge challenge. And so if we were to put out something, especially if we labeled it a rule, people would think that we're bound to it. And then how do we respond in situations that deviate from what we might've expected in the past? Um, and so, so, so that's what I would say part, part of the challenge is that it becomes difficult to actually put out a simple rule with you know, very clear, if this happens, we will go here. If this happens, we will go there type of language. Uh, I'm gonna, th- th- this captures a couple of the questions. Um, so essentially, the summary is, you know, is there a danger from being too precise? Is precise communication always good? And you sort of alluded to the times in, 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 a, in uncertain, highly uncertain times, uh, nighty and uncertain times, potentially, where, where, it's, where it's, um, it's not. But one thing you didn't really discuss is, um, so, so the question came in, which is, you know, might it lead to moral hazard problem as investors think there's a free you know put to exploit and so some t- there are certain issues on which you have to remain certain i'm going to add my own little rejoinder to that which is i wondered if and you may you may for for reasons of remit choose not to comment on this but whether or not you think the approach to communicating financial stability policies and uncertainties in those is different to monetary policy um so, so I'm going to sort of put those together in, in one. So personally, I do believe there is danger in being too precise. And um, our former governor, Polaz, was certainly of this view. And, um, you know, another way that he would talk about it is, you know, when you're really far away from where you know you're probably going, you know, giving an indication of a direction isn't really all that risky, Right. But once you get really close to where you think you might be going, and once things are settling down a bit, then that's a time where you know you might want to actually back off from sending signals. And that's that time where you know if you're too precise and you're saying, "Oh gosh, you know, it looks like this is going to be persisting very slightly below where we want things to be," and giving an indication of maybe policy is going to be going in some direction. You don't want people doing that bad. And this is something that Jill had referred to earlier. So the risks of being too precise, I would say, are particularly great when you're getting closer to where you want to be. Um, that's when there's actually, I would say, more value in having different people trying to 
you know, external people having different views on where things are and maybe where things are going and what policy should be doing. Um, so in general, if you're, you're standing in a position where you don't know for sure if the next rate could be up or down, that is not a time to be giving an indication that the next, you know, next rate action is likely to be up. Financial stability policies, I think, are a little different. Um, at the bank, what we have done is we will occasionally bring in issues related to vulnerabilities in the economy that are associated with financial stabilities when we link them up more to macro risks, uh, you know, macro risks on the outcome. Um, so, so that's an awful lot of precision in terms of what we try and do, but that's a lot of being vague on actual policies themselves. And I'm not certain that, you know, financial stability policies, I guess it's just because I see the, I see the financial stability space as one where there are so many potential vulnerabilities that can amplify the impact of shocks that it becomes a little more difficult ex ante to even think about, well, if things go in this direction, this would be the natural response because the vulner there are different vulnerabilities. The size of them and the consequences of them are shifting a lot over time. And even if the shifts are gradual, the importance of different vulnerabilities can also be shifting. So I, I think I'll stop there. I'm not sure if you have anything to add, Jill. No, I don't. Well, Jill, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on you. So, so, so Jacqueline Best asked the question here, which I I'm gonna uh, deliver. I think it's one that you will enjoy. Um, and I guess I guess at the heart of this question, and I'm not gonna read it out fully, but at the heart of the question is the challenges that come from addressing different audiences. You know, you may have some audiences like a general public who we've already discussed a few times here, probably don't have the attention or the engagement or the desire to sort of read the monetary policy report. But but then you have financial markets who do. And of course, sometimes when you speak, you don't know exactly which audience will get the message. Say if the governor goes on TV, you know, what the editors choose to put out as the clip and who watches that is not directly under your control. So So what would you say to the sort of people listening who are, uh, doing this in their own central banks that that you would are the challenges and how you address some of those yeah um it's a real challenge and uh, i'm sure jacqueline and others are facing it every day so I mean, part of the when, when you look at the central banks that are doing it really well uh bank of england i would argue is one of the best uh they you know they've they they have a core set of content uh whether it's a projection or a rate decision or a a policy measure and they layer the degree of, of detail uh, depending on the audience. And so if you look at the kind of layered communications, and we've adopted many of the strategies that the Bank of England has used, um, you've got the monetary policy report for the aficionados who are going to come to the briefing and want to know all the guts of the projections and all of that. Then you have a summary of the report um, that is sort of hitting the key messages and the highlights and giving a sort of general picture of what we're saying, then we would have you know, the opening statement for the press conference, and that is very much targeted at market participants and, and the media. And then we have a little video that we put up on Twitter that you know, would show, you know, again, the sort of key messages illustrated with very easy to understand charts. Um, so the, the core content stays the same, and you would just adjust the level of detail and the, and the delivery channel. Uh, to the audience that you want to reach. And I think you know, central banks around the world have used this to pretty good effect. Um, our experience is that it is effective, but we're not, we're, we're still too precise. Uh, we still have a ways to go before we really are relatable and comprehensible. Um, we're doing a lot of work through our museum to, to sort of reach into, you know, the, the students that are coming through with their teachers and the members of the general public that are coming in to get a real sense of what are you getting from this? What are you understanding? Uh, do these concepts mean any, anything to you? Um, you know, we are constantly uh, reminded that we, we have a ways to go to, to be as comprehensible as we think we are. Yeah, no, no, I think that's right. So uh, I'm, I'm going to fall into the trap now of also doing some shameless self-promotion, but uh, I, I have some work. It. Do it, do it, do it. Uh, I have some some work at the moment with someone who who was a student of mine, but is now actually at the Bank of England. But this work sort of predates him joining there. But it, it's exactly on this issue of how we simplify, and what it does specifically is it distinguishes between 
what you might call semantic complexity and conceptual complexity. And I think a lot of the efforts have focused on semantic complexity, whereas actually from a very young age, most of us are taught how to deal with semantic complexity, right? We can break up big words, we can cut sentences down. It may turn us off, but if we really want to get meaning, we, we, we can. I think about myself when I read in languages that are not my first language, I kind of break things up and I get there and a little bit of, you know, it's, it's hard, it's harder than reading in my first language, but you can do it. Conceptual complexity, on the other hand, is much more difficult. If, if you have to go off and find out what this GDP thing is, that can be really like a, a complete barrier to our ability to figure it out. And, uh, and, and so anyway, it, it looks like what really matters is that conceptual stuff. What's interesting is some of the early work that the bank did reduced both, but gradually they've allowed the conceptual to creep back up while keeping yeah. the semantic low. And that could be going exactly against what you might uh, want. But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll finish with that. Uh, we, we've overshot the hour slightly. Let me just throw two, two little extra questions in there just to, to, to round it off. And then if you have anything else you want to conclude on, you can. So, so uh, Julia uh, Kirali, apologies if I mispronounce it, asks, Bank of Canada, actually like most central banks, cannot be wholly independent from the monetary policy of the Fed. So how do you incorporate that uncertainty into your into your communication, you know, spillovers from you mentioned trading partners, Sharon earlier, but you know also there are the capital market links that many would be affected by. And then I'll I'll, I'll finish with this other question, uh, Jill. This one maybe for you then uh, from Luba, uh, who who just asked whether or not you have any measures or or observed any increase in public attention during the pandemic, more more traffic on the website. Although you said you know they don't come to the website, more. more Twitter action, or did the media better convey your your, your messages? So, so I'll, I'll leave it with those two, and then we'll we'll wrap up. So, in terms of our monetary policy um, and the interaction with the Fed, we produce a global projection, and the U.S. economy is the most important um, other economy in general for our trade. Actually, it's not quite true to the extent that China is very important for oil prices and we're an oil exporter. But in terms of raw trade, um, the US is our most important trading partner. So we do have an outlook for the US economy that feeds into our Canadian projection. And part of the outlook for the US economy is going to be, you know, what is US monetary policy doing? And that is going to partly matter because what U.S. monetary policy does has influence on interest rates. And as a small open economy, some of our longer term interest rates are going to be pulled around a little bit by what's happening in global interest rates. So we have that embedded in our projection and in our discussions of our policy decision. However, we don't actually like our policy is not a leader follow the Fed policy. Our policy is a policy that is based on achieving our own inflation target. So in that sense, what's going on in the United States and the policies in the United States are relevant for the Canadian economy and are therefore relevant for the monetary policy decisions in Canada. But we don't have an explicit link, if you will, between what they are doing in monetary policy space, therefore means we will be doing something in Canadian monetary policy space. So, so the channels are, we try to do the best we can in capturing all the channels in our models, um, but we don't actually end up saying that, well, you know, this is happening in the US, we better follow. A better way to think of it is we've got two advanced economies that are closely tied through trade. Ours is the small open economy. Shocks that hit the U.S. economy are going to also hit the Canadian economy, um, either through direct trade links or just from the fact that, you know, in some cases, both countries might be in the same, have the same industries represented. So that may show up at times as looking like there are correlations in the policy decisions. But we try to be clear in our communications in terms of why we're making the decisions we are. And it's not they're moving, we should move, unless what's making them move is making us move so that it looks like we're moving because they're moving. 
And Luba, in response to your question, we did see a generalized increase in traffic, uh, certainly to our social media sites at the height of the crisis. Um, and uh, I mean, there was a spike as the actions were taken. And then there was, I think if I'm recalling the data, which I don't have in front of me, there was a little bit of a lull. Frankly, people had other things on their minds, uh, like keeping their family safe and paying, paying their bills. Um, we, uh, but, but generalized, yes, we, we did see an increase in traffic and an increase in, in uh, people coming, looking for information. Uh, the biggest spike we've seen is, has been as we've started to normalize, as rates have gone up, uh, you know, in, in terms of visits to the site, social media mentions, public correspondence, uh, which, you know, what was, was high at the beginning of the crisis, then there was a bit of a lull, it's high again now. Part of that is our response. Mostly, it's about inflation. It's the fact that uh, that our inflation rate is much higher, and uh, we're an inflation targeter, and people are quite legitimately uh, trying to hold us to account. Excellent, perfect. Um, so we 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 set an upper limit always of quarter past on this. There's still four minutes, but I think uh, uh, I will uh, pass over uh, for any last word to both of you. If you want to say anything, if there's anything you wanted to say but didn't. Just thank you very much. This has um, been really worthwhile for us, and we're grateful to have had the opportunity to uh, be part of this event. No, thank you so much. Thank you for 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 your insights. And um, yeah, like I say, the 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 really exciting times. Um, uh, we're back in them for hopefully you know because the economies are growing and in inflation. The old the old fight is 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 difficult as well. You know, after a period of low inflation for a long time. So. Um, it's been fantastic hearing uh, the Bank of Canada's experience and and, and tying in uh, some of the uh, some of the messaging that you took even from from the WHO to guide your communication. Like I say, uh, we, we took that to heart on the Irish Fiscal Council as well. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks to everyone for joining in. Apologies if you asked a question, but I didn't get a chance to, to get to it. There was a huge number. Um, but just to uh, tell everyone to keep uh, eyes on the uh, usual channels. We will be back next month with uh, Emmy Nakamura, John Steinson, and Leyland Farmer presenting a, 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 an academic paper on uh, longer term persuasion and effects on expectations. But uh, until then, I, I, on behalf of everybody in the audience, I'm going to clap uh, and thank Sharon and Jill for their time and wish them a thank good so rest much. of their day. Thank you.